Chapter 14 Phenomena of Yogi Psychic Breathing With the exception of the instructions in the Yogi Rhythmic Breathing, the majority of the exercise heretofore given in this book relate to the physical plane of effort, which, while highly important in itself, is also regarded by the yogis as in the nature of affording a substantial basis for efforts on the psychic and spiritual plane. Do not, however, discard or think lightly of the physical phase of the subject, for remember that it needs a sound body to support a sound mind, and also that the body is the temple of the ego, the lamp in which burns the light of the spirit. Everything is good in its place, and everything has its place. The developed man is the all-round man, who recognizes body, mind and spirit and renders to each its due. Neglect of either is a mistake which must be rectified sooner or later, a debt which must be repaid with interest. We will now take up the psychic phase of the yogi science of breath in the shape of a series of exercises, each exercise carrying with it its explanation. You will notice that in each exercise rhythmic breathing is accompanied with the instructions to carry the thought of certain desired results. This mental attitude gives the will a clear track upon which to exercise its force. We cannot, in this work, go into the subject of the power of the will, and must assume that you have some knowledge of the subject. If you have no acquaintance with the subject, you will find that the actual practice of the exercises themselves will give you a much clearer knowledge than any amount of theoretical teaching, for as the old Hindu proverb says, he who tastes a grain of mustard seed knows more of its flavor than he who sees an elephant load of it. General Directions for Yogi Psychic Breathing The basis of all yogi psychic breathing is the yogi rhythmic breath, instruction regarding which we gave in our last chapter. In the following exercises, in order to avoid useless repetition, we will say merely, breathe rhythmically, and then give the instruction for the exercise of the psychic force, or directed willpower working in connection with the rhythmic breath vibrations. After a little practice you will find that you will not need to count after the first rhythmic breath, as the mind will grasp the idea of time and rhythm and you will be able to breathe rhythmically at pleasure, almost automatically. This will leave the mind clear for the sending of the psychic vibrations under the direction of the will. See the following first exercise for directions in using the will. Prana distributing. Lying flat on the floor or bed, completely relaxed, with hands resting lightly over the solar plexus, over the pit of the stomach, where the ribs begin to separate, breathe rhythmically. After the rhythm is fully established, well that each inhalation will draw in an increased supply of prana or vital energy from the universal supply, which will be taken up by the nervous system and stored in the solar plexus. At each inhalation, well that the prana or vital energy is being distributed all over the body, to every organ and part, to every muscle, cell and atom, to nerve, artery and vein, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, invigorating, strengthening and stimulating every nerve, recharging every nerve center, sending energy, force and strength all over the system. While exercising the will, try to form a mental picture of the inrushing prana, coming in through the lungs and being taken up at once by the solar plexus, then with the exhaling effort, being sent to all parts of the system, down to the fingertips and down to the toes. It is not necessary to use the will with an effort. Simply commanding that which you wish to produce and then making the mental picture of it is all that is necessary. Calm command with the mental picture is far better than forcible willing, which only dissipates force needlessly. The above exercise is most helpful and greatly refreshes and strengthens the nervous system and produces a restful feeling all over the body. It is especially beneficial in cases where one is tired or feels a lack of energy. Inhibiting pain. Lying down or sitting erect. Breath rhythmically, holding the thought that you are inhaling prana. Then when you exhale, send the prana to the painful part to re-establish the circulation and nerve current. Then inhale more prana for the purpose of driving out the painful condition. Then exhale, holding the thought that you are driving out the pain. Alternate the two above mental commands, and with one exhalation stimulate the part and with the next drive out the pain. Keep this up for seven breaths. Then practice the cleansing breath and rest a while. Then try it again until relief comes, which will be before long. Many pains will be found to be relieved before the seven breaths are finished. If the hand is placed over the painful part, you may get quicker results. Send the current of prana down the arm and into the painful part. 
directing the circulation. Lying down or sitting erect, breathe rhythmically, and with the exhalations direct the circulation to any part you wish, which may be suffering from imperfect circulation. This is effective in cases of cold feet or in cases of headache, the blood being sent downward in both cases, in the first case warming the feet, and in the latter relieving the brain from too great pressure. In the case of headache, try the pain inhibiting first, then follow with sending the blood downward. You will often feel a warm feeling in the legs as the circulation moves downward. The circulation is largely under the control of the will and rhythmic breathing renders the task easier. Self-healing. Lying in a relaxed condition, breathe rhythmically, and command that a good supply of prana be inhaled. With the exhalation, send the prana to the affected part for the purpose of stimulating it. Vary this occasionally by exhaling, with the mental command that the diseased condition be forced out and disappear. Use the hands in this exercise, passing them down the body from the head to the affected part. In using the hands in healing yourself or others always hold the mental image that the prana is flowing down the arm and through the fingertips into the body, thus reaching the affected part and healing it. Of course we can give only general directions in this book without taking up the several forms of disease in detail, but a little practice of the above exercise, varying it slightly to fit the conditions of the case, will produce wonderful results. Some yogis follow the plan of placing both hands on the affected part, and then breathing rhythmically, holding the mental image that they are fairly pumping prana into the diseased organ, and part stimulating it and driving out diseased conditions, as pumping into a pail of dirty water will drive out the latter and fill the bucket with fresh water. This last plan is very effective if the mental image of the pump is clearly held, the inhalation representing the lifting of the pump handle and the exhalation the actual pumping. Healing others. We cannot take up the question of the psychic treatment of disease by prana in detail in this book, as such would be foreign to its purpose but we can and will give you simple, plain instructions whereby you may be enabled to do much good in relieving others. The main principle to remember is that by rhythmic breathing and controlled thought you are enabled to absorb a considerable amount of prana, and are also able to pass it into the body of another person, stimulating weakened parts and organs and imparting health and driving out diseased conditions. You must first learn to form such a clear mental image of the desired condition that you will be able to actually feel the influx of prana, and the force running down your arms and out of your fingertips into the body of the patient. Breathe rhythmically a few times until the rhythm is fairly established, then place your hands upon the affected part of the body of the patient, letting them rest lightly over the part. Then follow that pumping process described in the preceding exercise self-healing and fill the patient full of prana until the diseased condition is driven out. Every once in a while raise the hands and flick the fingers as if you were throwing off the diseased condition. It is well to do this occasionally and also to wash the hands after treatment as otherwise you may take on a trace of the diseased condition of the patient. Also practice the cleansing breath several times after the treatment. During the treatment let the prana pour into the patient in one continuous stream, allowing yourself to be merely the pumping machinery connecting the patient with the universal supply of prana, and allowing it to flow freely through you. You need not work the hands vigorously, but simply enough that the prana freely reaches the affected parts. The rhythmic breathing must be practiced frequently during the treatment so as to keep the rhythm normal and to afford the prana a free passage. It is better to place the hands on the bare skin, but where this is not advisable or possible place them over the clothing. Vary above method occasionally during the treatment by stroking the body gently and softly with the fingertips, the fingers being kept slightly separated. This is very soothing to the patient. In cases of long standing you may find it helpful to give the mental command in words, such as get out, get out, or be strong, be strong, as the case may be the words helping you to exercise the will more forcibly and to the point. Vary these instructions to suit the needs of the case, and use your own judgment and inventive faculty. We have given you the general principles and you can apply them in hundreds of different ways. The above apparently simple instruction, if carefully studied and applied, will enable one to accomplish all that the leading magnetic healers are able to, although their systems are more or less cumbersome and complicated. They're using prana ignantly and calling it magnetism.
If they would combine rhythmic breathing with their magnetic treatment they would double their efficiency. Distant healing. Prana colored by the thought of the sender may be projected to persons at a distance, who are willing to receive it, and healing work done in this way. This is the secret of the absent healing, of which the Western world has heard so much of late years. The thought of the healer sends forth and colors the prana of the sender, and it flashes across space and finds lodgment in the psychic mechanism of the patient. It is unseen, and like the Marconi waves, it passes through intervening obstacles and seeks the person attuned to receive it. In order to treat persons at a distance, you must form a mental image of them until you can feel yourself to be in rapport with them. This is a psychic process dependent upon the mental imagery of the healer. You can feel the sense of rapport when it is established, it manifesting in a sense of nearness. That is about as plain as we can describe it. It may be acquired by a little practice, and some will get it at the first trial. When rapport is established, say mentally to the distant patient, I am sending you a supply of vital force or power, which will invigorate you and heal you. Then picture the prana as leaving your mind with each exhalation of rhythmic breath, and traveling across space instantaneously and reaching the patient and healing him. It is not necessary to fix certain hours for treatment, although you may do so if you wish. The receptive condition of the patient, as he is expecting and opening himself up to your psychic force, attunes him to receive your vibrations whenever you may send them. If you agree upon hours, let him place himself in a relaxed attitude and receptive condition. The above is the great underlying principle of the absent treatment of the Western world. You may do these things as well as the most noted healers, with a little practice. Chapter 15 More Phenomena of Yogi Psychic Breathing Thought Projection Thoughts may be projected by following the last mentioned method distant healing and others will feel the effect of thought so sent forth, it being remembered always that no evil thought can ever injure another person whose thoughts are good. Good thoughts are always positive to bad ones, and bad ones always negative to good ones. One can, however, excite the interest and attention of another by sending him thought waves in this way, charging the prana with the message he wishes to convey. If you desire another's love and sympathy, and possess love and sympathy for him, you can send him thoughts of this kind with effect, providing your motives are pure. Never, however, attempt to influence another to his hurt, or from impure or selfish motives, as such thoughts only recoil upon the sender with redoubled force, and injure him, while the innocent party is not affected. Psychic force when legitimately used is all right, but be aware of black magic or improper and unholy uses of it, as such attempts are like playing with a dynamo, and the person attempting such things will be surely punished by the result of the act itself. However, no person of impure motives ever acquires a great degree of psychic power, and a pure heart and mind is an invulnerable shield against improper psychic power. Keep yourself pure and nothing can hurt you. Forming an aura. If you are ever in the company of persons of a low order of mind, and you feel the depressing influence of their thought, breathe rhythmically a few times, thus generating an additional supply of prana, and then by means of the mental image method surround yourself with an egg-shaped thought aura, which will protect you from the gross thought and disturbing influences of others. Recharging yourself. If you feel that your vital energy is at a low ebb, and that you need to store up a new supply quickly, the best plan is to place the feet close together side by side, of course, and to lock the fingers of both hands in any way that seems the most comfortable. This closes the circuit, as it were, and prevents any escape of prana through the extremities. Then breathe rhythmically a few times, and you will feel the effect of the recharging. Recharging others. If some friend is deficient in vitality you may aid him by sitting in front of him, your toes touching his, and his hands in yours. Then both breathe rhythmically, you forming the mental image of sending prana into his system, and he holding the mental image of receiving the prana. Persons of weak vitality or passive will should be careful with whom they try this experiment, as the prana of a person of evil desires will be colored with the thoughts of the person, and may give him a temporary influence over the weaker person. The latter, 
however, may easily remove such influence by closing the circuit as before mentioned and breathing a few rhythmic breaths, closing with the cleansing breath. Charging water. Water may be charged with prana, by breathing rhythmically, and holding the glass of water by the bottom, in the left hand, and then gathering the fingers of the right hand together and shaking them gently over the water, as if you were shaking drops of water off of your fingertips into the glass. The mental image of the prana being passed into the water must also be held. Water thus charged is found stimulating to weak or sick persons, particularly if a healing thought accompanies the mental image of the transfer of the prana. The caution given in the last exercise applies also to this one, although the danger exists only in a greatly lessened degree. Acquiring Mental Qualities Not only can the body be controlled by the mind under direction of the will, but the mind itself can be trained and cultivated by the exercise of the controlling will. This, which the Western world knows as mental science, etc., has proved to the Western portions of the truth which the yogi has known for ages. The mere calm demand of the will accomplishes wonders in this direction, but if the mental exercise is accompanied by rhythmic breathing, the effect is greatly increased. Desirable qualities may be acquired by holding the proper mental image of what is desired during rhythmic breathing. Poise and self-control, desirable qualities, increased power, etc. may be acquired in this way. Undesirable qualities may be eliminated by cultivating the opposite qualities. Any or all the mental science exercises, treatments and affirmations may be used with the yogi rhythmic breath. The following is a good general exercise for the acquirement and development of desirable mental qualities. Lie in a passive attitude, or sit erect. Picture to yourself the qualities you desire to cultivate, seeing yourself as possessed of the qualities, and demanding that your mind develop the quality. Breathe rhythmically, holding the mental picture firmly. Carry the mental picture with you as much as possible, and endeavor to live up to the ideal you have set up in your mind. You will find yourself gradually growing up to your ideal. The rhythm of the breathing assists the mind in forming new combinations, and the student who has followed the Western system will find the yogi rhythmic breathing a wonderful ally in his mental science works. Acquiring Physical Qualities Physical qualities may be acquired by the same methods as above mentioned in connection with mental qualities. We do not mean, of course, that short men can be the made tall, or that amputated limbs may be replaced, or similar miracles. But the expression of the countenance may be changed. Courage and general physical characteristics improved by the control of the will, accompanied by rhythmic breathing. As a man thinks so does he look, act, walk, sit, etc. Improved thinking will mean improved looks and actions. To develop any part of the body, direct the attention to it, while breathing rhythmically, holding the mental picture that you are sending an increased amount of prana, or nerve force, to the part, and thus increasing its vitality and developing it. This plan applies equally well to any part of the body which you wish to develop. Many Western athletes use a modification of this plan in their exercises. The student who has followed our instructions so far will readily understand how to apply the yogi principles in the above work. The general rule of exercise is the same as in the preceding exercise acquiring mental qualities. We have touched upon the subject of the cure of physical ailments in preceding pages. Controlling the emotions. The undesirable emotions, such as fear, worry, anxiety, hate, anger, jealousy, envy, melancholy, excitement, grief, etc., are amenable to the control of the will, and the will is enabled to operate more easily in such cases if rhythmic breathing is practiced while the student is willing. The following exercise has been found most effective by the yogi students, although the advanced yogi has but little need of it, as he has long since gotten rid of these undesirable mental qualities by growing spiritually beyond them. The yogi student, however, finds the exercise a great help to him while he is growing. Breathe rhythmically, concentrating the attention upon the solar plexus, and sending to it the mental command, get out. Send the mental command firmly, just as you begin to exhale, and form the mental picture of the undesirable emotions being carried away with the exhaled breath. Repeat seven times, and finish with the cleansing breath, and then see how good you feel. The mental command must be given in earnest, as trifling will not do the work. 
transmutation of the reproductive energy. The yogis possess great knowledge regarding the use and abuse of the reproductive principle in both sexes. Some hints of this esoteric knowledge have filtered out and have been used by Western writers on the subject, and much good has been accomplished in this way. In this little book we cannot do more than touch upon the subject, and omitting all except a bare mention of theory, we will give a practical breathing exercise whereby the student will be enabled to transmute the reproductive energy into vitality for the entire system, instead of dissipating and wasting it in lustful indulgences in or out of the marriage relations. The reproductive energy is creative energy, and may be taken up by the system and transmuted into strength and vitality, thus serving the purpose of regeneration instead of generation. If the young men of the Western world understood these underlying principles they would be saved much misery and unhappiness in after years, and would be stronger mentally, morally and physically. This transmutation of the reproductive energy gives great vitality to those practicing it. They will be filled with great vital force, which will radiate from them and will manifest in what has been called personal magnetism. The energy thus transmuted may be turned into new channels and used to great advantage. Nature has condensed one of its most powerful manifestations of prana into reproductive energy, as its purpose is to create. The greatest amount of vital force is concentrated in the smallest area. The reproductive organism is the most powerful storage battery in animal life, and its force can be drawn upward and used, as well as expended in the ordinary functions of reproduction, or wasted in riotous lust. The majority of our students know something of the theories of regeneration, and we can do little more than to state the above facts, without attempting to prove them. The yogi exercise for transmuting reproductive energy is simple. It is coupled with rhythmic breathing, and can be easily performed. It may be practiced at any time, but is specially recommended when one feels the instinct most strongly, at which time the reproductive energy is manifesting and may be the most easily transmuted for regenerative purposes. The exercise is as follows. Keep the mind fixed on the idea of energy, and away from ordinary sexual thoughts or imaginings. If these thoughts come into the mind do not be discouraged but regard them as manifestations of a force which you intend using for the purposes of strengthening the body and mind. Lie passively or sit erect, and fix your mind on the idea of drawing the reproductive energy upward to the solar plexus, where it will be transmuted and stored away as a reserve force of vital energy. Then breathe rhythmically, forming the mental image of drawing up the reproductive energy with each inhalation. With each inhalation make a command of the will that the energy be drawn upward from the reproductive organization to the solar plexus. If the rhythm is fairly established and the mental image is clear, you will be conscious of the upward passage of the energy, and will feel its stimulating effect. If you desire an increase in mental force, you may draw it up to the brain instead of to the solar plexus, by giving the mental command and holding the mental image of the transmission to the brain. The man or woman doing mental creative work, or bodily creative work, will be able to use this creative energy in their work by following the above exercise, drawing up the energy with the inhalation and sending it forth with the exhalation. In this last form of exercise, only such portions as are needed in the work will pass into the work being done, the balance remaining stored up in the solar plexus. You will understand, of course, that it is not the reproductive fluids which are drawn up and used but the etheric pranic energy which animates the latter, the soul of the reproductive organism, as it were. It is usual to allow the head to bend forward easily and naturally during the transmuting exercise. Brain Stimulating The yogis have found the following exercise most useful in stimulating the action of the brain for the purpose of producing clear thinking and reasoning. It has a wonderful effect in clearing the brain and nervous system, and those engaged in mental work will find it most useful to them, both in the direction of enabling them to do better work and also as a means of refreshing the mind and clearing it after arduous mental labor. Sit in an erect posture, keeping the spinal column straight, and the eyes well to the front, letting the hands rest on the upper part of the legs. Breathe rhythmically, but instead of breathing through both nostrils as in the ordinary exercises, Press the left nostril closed with the thumb, and inhale through the right nostril. Then remove the thumb, and close the right nostril with the finger, and then exhale through the left nostril. Then, without changing the fingers, inhale through the left nostril, and changing fingers, exhale through the right. 
then inhale through right and exhale through left, and so on, alternating nostrils as above mentioned, closing the unused nostril with the thumb or forefinger. This is one of the oldest forms of yogi breathing, and is quite important and valuable, and is well worthy of acquirement. But it is quite amusing to the yogis to know that to the western world this method is often held out as being the whole secret of yogi breathing. To the minds of many western readers, yogi breathing suggests nothing more than a picture of a Hindu, sitting erect, and alternating nostrils in the act of breathing. Only this and nothing more. We trust that this little work will open the eyes of the Western world to the great possibilities of yogi breathing, and the numerous methods whereby it may be employed. The Grand Yogi Psychic Breath The yogis have a favorite form of psychic breathing which they practice occasionally, to which has been given a Sanskrit term of which the above is a general equivalent. We have given it last, as it requires practice on the part of the student in the line of rhythmic breathing and mental imagery which he has now acquired by means of the preceding exercises. The general principles of the grand breath may be summed up in the old Hindu saying, Blessed is the yogi who can breathe through his bones. This exercise will fill the entire system with pran, and the student will emerge from it with every bone, muscle, nerve, cell, tissue, organ and part energized and attuned by the prana and the rhythm of the breath. It is a general house cleaning of the system, and he who practices it carefully will feel as if he had been given a new body, freshly created, from the crown of his head to the tips of his toes. We will let the exercise speak for itself. Lie in a relaxed position, at perfect ease. Breathe rhythmically until the rhythm is perfectly established. Then, inhaling and exhaling, form the mental image of the breath being drawn up through the bones of the legs, and then forced out through them then through the bones of the arms, then through the top of the skull, then through the stomach, then through the reproductive region, then as if it were traveling upward and downward along the spinal column, and then as if the breath were being inhaled and exhaled through every pore of the skin, the whole body being filled with prana and life. Then, breathing rhythmically, send the current of prana to the seven vital centers, in turn, as follows, using the mental picture as in previous exercises to the forehead, to the back of the head, to the base of the brain, to the solar plexus, to the sacral region lower part of the spine, to the region of the navel, to the reproductive region. Finish by sweeping the current of prana, to and fro from head to feet several times. Finish with cleansing breath. Chapter 16 Yogi Spiritual Breathing The yogis not only bring about desired mental qualities and properties by willpower coupled with rhythmic breathing, but they also develop spiritual faculties, or rather aid in their unfoldment, in the same way. The oriental philosophies teach that man has many faculties which are at present in a dormant state, but which will become unfolded as the race progresses. They also teach that man, by the proper effort of the will, aided by favorable conditions, may aid in the unfoldment of these spiritual faculties, and develop them much sooner than in the ordinary process of evolution. In other words, one may even now develop spiritual powers of consciousness which will not become the common property of the race until after long ages of gradual development under the law of evolution. In all of the exercises directed toward this end, rhythmic breathing plays an important part. There is of course no mystic property in the breath itself which produces such wonderful results, but the rhythm produced by the yogi breath is such as to bring the whole system, including the brain, under perfect control, and in perfect harmony, and by this means, the most perfect condition is obtained for the unfoldment of these latent faculties. In this work we cannot go deeply, into the philosophy of the East regarding spiritual development, because this subject would require volumes to cover it and then again the subject is too abstruse to interest the average reader. There are also other reasons, well known to occultists, why this knowledge should not be spread broadcast at this time. Rest assured, dear student, that when the time comes for you to take the next step, the way will be opened out before you. When the Chela student is ready, the Guru Master appears. In this chapter we will give you directions for the development of two phases of spiritual consciousness, that is, 1. The consciousness of the identity of the soul, 
and two, the consciousness of the connection of the soul with the universal life. Both of the exercises given below are simple, and consist of mental images firmly held, accompanied with rhythmic breathing. The student must not expect too much at the start, but must make haste slowly, and be content to develop as does the flower, from seed to blossom. Soul Consciousness the real self is not the body or even the mind of man. These things are but a part of his personality, the lesser self. The real self is the ego, whose manifestation is in individuality. The real self is independent of the body, which it inhabits, and is even independent of the mechanism of the mind, which it uses as an instrument. The real self is a drop from the divine ocean, and is eternal and indestructible. It cannot die or be annihilated and no matter what becomes of the body, the real self still exists. It is the soul. Do not think of your soul as a thing apart from you, for you are the soul, and the body is the unreal and transitory part of you which is changing in material every day, and which you will someday discard. You may develop the faculties so that they will be conscious of the reality of the soul, and its independence of the body. The yogi plan for such development is by meditation upon the real self or soul, accompanied by rhythmic breathing. The following exercise is the simplest form. Exercise. Place your body in a relaxed, reclining position. Breathe rhythmically, and meditate upon the real self, thinking of yourself as an entity independent of the body, although inhabiting it and being able to leave it at will. Think of yourself, not as the body, but as a spirit, and of your body as but a shell, useful and comfortable but not a part of the real you. Think of yourself as an independent being, using the body only as a convenience. While meditating, ignore the body entirely, and you will find that you will often become almost entirely unconscious of it, and will seem to be out of the body to which you may return when you are through with the exercise. This is the gist of the yogi meditative breathing methods, and if persisted in will give one a wonderful sense of the reality of the soul, and will make him seem almost independent of the body. The sense of immortality will often come with this increased consciousness, and the person will begin to show signs of spiritual development which will be noticeable to himself and others. But he must not allow himself to live too much in the upper regions, or to despise his body, for he is here on this plane for a purpose, and he must not neglect his opportunity to gain the experiences necessary to round him out, nor must he fail to respect his body, which is the temple of the spirit. The Universal Consciousness the spirit in man, which is the highest manifestation of his soul, is a drop in the ocean of spirit, apparently separate and distinct, but yet really in touch with the ocean itself, and with every other drop in it. As man unfolds in spiritual consciousness he becomes more and more aware of his relation to the universal spirit, or universal mind as some term it. He feels at times as if he were almost in at one moment with it, and then again he loses the sense of contact and relationship. The yogis seek to attain this state of universal consciousness by meditation and rhythmic breathing, and many have thus attained the highest degree of spiritual attainment possible to man in this stage of his existence. The student of this work will not need the higher instruction regarding adeptship at this time, as he has much to do and accomplish before he reaches that stage, but it may be well to initiate him into the elementary stages of the yogi exercises for developing universal consciousness and if he is in earnest he will discover means and methods whereby he may progress. The way is always open to him who is ready to tread the path. The following exercise will be found to do much toward developing the universal consciousness in those who faithfully practice it. Exercise. Place your body in a reclining, relaxed position. Breathe rhythmically, and meditate upon your relationship with the universal mind of which you are but an atom. Think of yourself as being in touch with all, and at one moment with all. See all as one, and your soul is a part of that one. Feel that you are receiving the vibrations from the great universal mind, and are partaking of its power and strength and wisdom. The two following lines of meditation may be followed. With each inhalation, think of yourself as drawing into yourself the strength and power of the universal mind. When exhaling think of yourself as passing out to others that same power, at the same time being filled with love for every living thing, and desiring that be a partaker of the same blessings which you are now receiving. Let the universal power circulate through you. Place your mind in a reverential state, and meditate upon the grandeur of the universal mind, 
and open yourself to the inflow of the divine wisdom, which will fill you with illuminating wisdom, and then let the same flow out from you to your brothers and sisters whom you love and would help. This exercise leaves with those who have practiced it a newfound sense of strength, power and wisdom, and a feeling of spiritual exaltation and bliss. It must be practiced only in a serious, reverential mood, and must not be approached triflingly or lightly. General Directions the exercises given in this chapter require the proper mental attitude and conditions, and the trifler and person of a non-serious nature, or one without a sense of spirituality and reverence, had better pass them by, as no results will be obtained by such persons, and besides it is a willful trifling with things of a high order, which course never benefits those who pursue it. These exercises are for the few who can understand them, and the others will feel no attraction to try them. During meditation let the mind dwell upon the ideas given in the exercise, until it becomes clear to the mind, and gradually manifests in real consciousness within you. The mind will gradually become passive and at rest, and the mental image will manifest clearly. Do not indulge in these exercises too often, and do not allow the blissful state produced to render you dissatisfied with the affairs of everyday life, as the latter are useful and necessary for you, and you must never shirk a lesson, however disagreeable to you it may be. Let the joy arising from the unfolding consciousness buoy you up and nerve you for the trials of life, and not make you dissatisfied and disgusted. All is good, and everything has its place. Many of the students who practice these exercises will in time wish to know more. Rest assured that when the time comes we will see that you do not seek in vain. Go on in courage and confidence, keeping your face toward the east, from whence comes the rising sun. Peace be unto you, and unto all men. Om. What is the Yogi Philosophy? The Yogi Philosophy comprises the teachings which have come down the centuries of thought, investigation, experiment and demonstration on the part of the advanced minds of the Yogi Masters of India, Chaldo. Persia, Egypt and ancient Greece down to the present time from master to student Guru to Chela. It is the oldest philosophy in the world, although to the Western world it comes as a new message, a message from the East. The Masters. There have been in all ages certain highly developed, advanced and exalted souls in the flesh, known as the Yogi Masters and Adepts, although many of the tales told concerning them are myths, or pure fiction originating in the minds of some modern sensational writers. The master yogis have passed from lower to higher planes of consciousness, thus gaining wisdom, power and qualities that seem almost miraculous to the man of the ordinary consciousness. A Hindu writer speaking of them has said, to him who hath travelled far along the path, sorrow ceases to trouble, fetters cease to bind, obstacles cease to hinder. Such a one is free. For him there is no more trouble or sorrow. For him there are no more unconscious rebirths. His old karma is exhausted, and he creates no new karma. His heart is freed from the desire for future life. No new longings arise within his soul. He is like a lamp which burneth from the oil of the spirit, and not from the oil of the outer world. The master yogis are able to pass through material obstacles, walls, ramparts, etc. He is able to throw his phantasmal appearance in many places at once. He acquires the power of hearing the sounds of the unseen world as distinctly as those of the phenomenal world, more distinctly in point of fact. Also by his power he is able to read the most secret thoughts of others, and to tell their characters. Such are the yogi masters. The real and the imitation. The Western student is apt to be somewhat confused in his ideas regarding the yogis and their philosophy and practice. Travelers to India have written great tales about the hordes of fakirs, mendicants and mountebanks who infest the great roads of India and the streets of its cities, and who impudently claim the title yogi. The Western student is scarcely to be blamed for thinking of the typical yogi as an emaciated, fanatical, dirty, ignorant Hindu, who either sits in a fixed posture until his body becomes ossified or else holds his arm up in the air until it becomes stiff and withered and forever after remains in that position, or perhaps clenches his fist and holds it tight until his fingernails grow through the palm of his hands. That these people exist is true, but their claim to the title yogi seems as absurd to the true yogi as does the claim to the title doctor on the part of the man who pairs one's corn seen to the eminent surgeon, or as does the title of professor 
as assumed by the street corner vendor of worm medicine, seemed to the president of Harvard or Yale. The science of yoga. There have been for ages past in India and other oriental countries yogi masters who devoted their time and attention to the development of man, physically, mentally and spiritually. The experience of generations of earnest seekers has been handed down for centuries from teacher to pupil, and gradually a definite yoga science was built up. To these investigations and teachings was finally applied the term yogi, from the Sanskrit word yug, meaning to join. The threefold path. Yoga is divided into several branches, ranging from that which teaches the control of the body, to that which teaches the highest spiritual development. Men are of varying temperaments, and the course that which will best suit one will not be adapted to the requirements of another. One will seek progress and development in one direction, and another in a different way, and a third by a still different course. The yogi philosophy teaches that the way that seems to appeal the most to a man's general temperament and disposition is the one best adapted to his use at the present time. They divide the path of attainment into three paths leading up to the great main road. They call these three paths, Raja Yoga, Karma Yoga, Nan Yoga. Each of these forms of yoga being a path leading to the great road, and each being traveled by those who may prefer it, but all led to the same place. We will now give a brief description of each of the three paths, which together are known to the yogis as the threefold path. The various branches. Each branch of yoga is but a path leading toward the one end unfoldment, development, and growth. He who wishes first to develop, control and strengthen his physical body so as to render it a fit instrument of the higher self, follows the path of Hatha Yoga. He who would develop his will power and mental faculties, unfolding the inner senses, and latent powers, follows the path of Raja Yoga. He who wishes to develop by knowing, by studying the fundamental principles and the wonderful truths underlying life, follows the path of Nan Yoga. And he who wishes to grow into a union with the one life by the influence of love, he follows the path of Bhikta Yoga. But it must not be supposed that the student must ally himself to only a single one of these paths to power. In fact, very few do. The majority prefer to gain a rounded knowledge and acquaint themselves with the principles of the several branches, learning something of each, giving preference of course to those branches that appeal to them more strongly, this attraction being the indication of need, or requirement, and, therefore, being the hand pointing out the path. It is well for everyone to know something of Hatha Yoga, in order that the body may be purified, strengthened and kept in health in order to become a more fitting instrument of the higher self. It is well that each one should know something of Raja Yoga, that he may understand the training and control of the mind, and the use of the will. It is well that everyone should learn the wisdom of Nan Yoga, that he may realize the wonderful truths underlying life, the science of being the scientific and intellectual knowing of the great questions regarding life and what lies back of life, the riddle of the universe. And it is well that everyone should know something of Big Dai Yoga, that he may understand the great teachings regarding the love underlying all life. The man best calculated to make general advancement along occult lines, is one who avoids running to extremes in any one of the branches of the subject, but who, while in the main following his own inclination toward certain forms of yoga, still keeps up a general acquaintance with the several phases of the great philosophy. In the end, man must develop on all his many sides, and why not keep in touch with all sides while we journey along? By following this course we avoid one-sidedness, fanaticism, narrowness, short-sightedness and bigotry. Those for whom the teachings are intended. Our books are intended only for those who feel an earnest attraction towards their higher teachings. They are for earnest students, inspired by their highest motives. Those for whom these teachings are intended will feel attracted to them. If you feel attracted toward these works, we will be glad to have you study them. If not we will feel just as kindly toward you, and will send you our best wishes for the hastening of the day when you will be ready for the advanced teachings. The matter is one entirely for the guidance of your higher self let it decide for you. To those to whom a glimpse of the inner life has been given, the yogi philosophy will prove a treasury of the rarest jewels, and each time he studies it he will see new gems. To many it will be the first revelation of that which they have been all their lives blindly seeking. 
To many it will be the first bit of spiritual bread given to satisfy the hunger of the soul. To many it will be the first cup of water from the spring of life, given to quench the thirst which has consumed them. Those for whom this teaching is intended will recognize its message, and after it they will never be the same as before it came to them. As the poet has said, where I pass all my children know me, and so will the children of the light recognize the teaching as for them. As for the others, we can only say that they will in time be ready for this great message. Some will be able to understand much of the teaching from the first, while others will see but dimly even the first steps. The student, however, will find that when he has firmly planted his foot on one of these steps, he will find the one just ahead becoming dimly illuminated, so as to give him confidence to take the next step. Let none be discouraged, the fact that this teaching attracts you will in time unfold its meaning. Study it over and over often, and you will find veil after veil lifted, though veil upon veil still remains between you and that beyond. Peace be to you. Advice to Beginners We advise interested beginners to study first our 14 lessons in Yogi philosophy which give a general outline of the entire subject. The beginner will also do well to study Hatha Yogi in order to render his physical body healthy and sound and thus give the spirit a worthy temple in which to manifest. Science of breath may also be studied to advantage by the beginners. As the student proceeds and develops in understanding he may take up the study of our advanced course, then Raja Yogi and Nan Yoga as his interest and desires dictate. Our little manual Light on the Path and Illumined Way will fit him well at this stage. We will be glad to furnish inquirers with advice regarding the books they need, if they will ask us for the same. Each student of this subject, however, finds himself attracted to the books he needs, this is the law. As the teachers have written, know, O disciple, that those who have passed through the silence, and felt its peace, and retained its strength, they long that you shall pass through it also. Therefore, in the hall of learning, when he is capable of entering there, the disciple will always find his master. And so, the inclination toward the required book comes in due time.